people, how you doing? Happy, happy preparation day once again. In a few hours, the Sabbath will be coming in. In a few hours, the Sabbath will be coming in, and another week ending will begin. Uh, first four months, let me say, I want to give all honor, all praise, all glory to the Most High God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whose name, if you did not know, is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is his name. My name is Noel Berry. I'm a facilitator of the Israel Bible Study Institute, where our goals and our objective is to bring biblical literacy to a biblically illiterate world through the reading of the uncut word of God. Uh, we've been going through a series of lessons thus far using the commandments that the Lord gave us in, uh, I believe it was 1 John 4 and 1, where it says, Beloved, believe not every word, but try to, I mean, beloved, be not every spirit, but try the spirit and see if they are of God, because many of false prophets have gone out into the world. And that's what we've been doing. Last, the last two weeks, we were dealing with the belief that there, the commandments have been done away with, the commandments are no longer in effect, the commandments are or no longer in existence, been nailed to the cross. And we've seen last week, the last two weeks, where in order to believe that, there's a numerous scriptures that you have to get rid of in the Bible in order to substantiate that claim. Well, this week we're going to deal with another topic that I believe is very detrimental to a person's salvation, and that is the rapture. Well, the, and like I said, with this, the intent of this program is not to get anyone to change their beliefs or their opinions or their concepts or ideologies. The intent of this program is just to read the word of God and do what the Lord said. We're going to take what they said or what anybody says and compare it to what the word of God says and see if it lines up. If it lines up, then we have to take it as being the word of God. If not, we have to drop it. That's if you want to live your life worship, righteously. But anyway, as I said, we'll deal with the, uh, we're going to deal with the rapture today because, to me, I think that's a very, a very uh, detrimental doctrine because if it's true, there's nothing to worry about. But if it's not true, then you find, a, and if a person who believes in the rapture finds himself caught up in the great tribulation for which they were told that, they, they would not have to experience because they're going to be ratcheted off. Then as, they, as the days continue to go by and they're in the great tribulation, their belief is going to be crumbled. They're going to begin to think that everything that they were taught was false. So then when it comes time to taking the mark of the beast, they have no problem accepting it because everything else they were told about this in this book was a lie. So therefore, we I think it's very important, very important that we analyze this rapture doctrine and see whether it's of God or not. Uh, a lot of people who I speak to, when I talk to them about those who say that they're Christian, when I talk to them about, you know, what does your church prepare you for the end time uh, event? And they always say, well, they don't have to worry about it because Jesus is going to rapture them off. And this is prevalent amongst people who call themselves Christians. So I want to take time to just go through this and analyze and then, and then, you know, once we have enough correct information, then we'll be able to make an informed decision as to whether or not the rapture is true or false. So with that, I'd like to start the lesson, and I just simply call it the rapture, true or false. The rapture basically, in a nutshell, if you ask anybody, and basically all the research that I've done as I'm preparing this lesson, is this. People believe that there's going to come a time before the tribulation occurs, where Jesus is going to return back to earth and take his people who are his true believers and remove them out of the way of harm that is going to come about the earth during the tribulation and call them to some place of safety for the three and a half years. Some people say it's seven years, those who believe in the rapture. Some people say this rapture is going to be a, a secret event. No one's no, going to know about it. Some people say it's going to be uh, people just going to get plucked up out of the sky or while they're driving their cars or walking down the street, people just going to start disappearing 
uh, miraculously out, out of the blue when it comes time for the Lord to return and take his people away from this uh, tribulation that's fixing to unfold. They also, and in that they use certain scriptures, but in that scripture that they use, which we're going to analyze, is that the first people to be put on this rapture bus are going to be those who are already dead in Christ. So the dead are going to be rose, rose from their grave first, put on the rapture bus, and then those who are still alive on the earth at the time that Christ returns are going to get placed on the rapture bus and then taken to some secret location. And all this event is going to be occur in secrecy or unknowns to those of people who are considered those left behind. And that is basically what the rapture is. And they get this belief from... First Thessalonians, which is going to be where we're going to start at, and we need to put a marker there because we're going to be jumping in and out of First Thessalonians four. First Thessalonians four and sixteen is where they get their rapture belief from, and we're going to thoroughly analyze. This is a lot of stuff that I have in here, and there's a lot of stuff that I've taken out for the sake of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll pray that the Lord allows me to put enough information on the table concerning the rapture as it relates to the word of God so that at the end of it, people will be able to make an informed decision on their own based upon the stuff that we've read. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to start at verse 16, which is where they get their rapture doctrine from. For the Lord himself said to send from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead of Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And this is where they get their, their rapture doctrine from right here. But just off the top, for those who said, who believe it's going to be a secret rapture, then we got to eliminate the fact that it said that the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. You know, that's a, that's, that's a lot of noise going about, but we're going to get into that. But, later on, but what I want to highlight is this. they are taking this two verses and building a whole doctrine around it without any other supporting verses. Then these two verses are two verses in the middle of a letter that was written by Paul to some people. So what I plan on doing in this first part is putting these two verses back in the context with the group of verses that is uh, written in and see what actually Paul was speaking about, what he actually speaking about the believers in Christ being swooped up and taken to some secure location during the time of tribulation, or was he actually talking about something else? So with that, we need to turn to First Thessalonians. I mean, keep we need to keep a marker right here because we're coming. We're going to be jumping in and out of this all day long. But we're going to turn to First Thessalonians, chapter one, and we're going to pick it up at verse one. First Thessalonians, chapter one, verse one. Paul and Sabinius and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Jesus and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul is writing his letters to the church in Thessalonians, meaning he's writing his letter to some believers of Christ in Thessalonians. He's not writing to the whole people of Thessalonians, just like if he was to write a letter to the believers in America, he'd be, writing, he would, he'd be writing to us in America, but he's not talking about the whole citizenship, uh, citizenry of America. He's only speaking to those individuals who are believers in Christ. So this is who his letter is addressed to. Now with that, in, now with that established, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13 and read down into their rapture doctrine scriptures, they two verses that they use to get an understanding of what Paul was talking about. He's talking to these Thessalonians who are believers in Christ. So let's pick it up at uh, 1 Thessalonians verse 4, I mean chapter 4, verse 13. 
But I would not have you be, I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers. Being ignorant. He was, Paul is saying, I will not have you be ignorant, be unaware, uninformed, being not knowledgeable in a particular thing. That's what ignorant is. So, but I would have you not, but I, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others have, which others have no hope. So he's writing this particular part of concerning some people who are asleep. So let's get some clarification because this is one of the words that needs to be quantified. Asleep. What is he talking about? Well, you can go through many parts of, of the Bible and get an understanding in what aspect is spoken of. And this aspect, well, I'm going to read to you first. Let me read to you. Let, 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 let the word of God tell us first. And this aspect right here, Let's go to uh, John 11. We want to determine sleep. Let's go to John. You got to keep a marker right here. We're going to go to John 11. And pick it up at verse 11. Now this is during the time. This is during the time where uh, information was brought to Jesus that his friend Lazarus has died and he's several days, I believe he's two days away from reaching the place where Lazarus lives. So the information is came to Jesus that Lazarus died. So we're going to pick it up at verse 11. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples about Lazarus and his death. Verse 11, John 11, verse 11. These things he said, and after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. So, so Jesus is saying that Lazarus is asleep. So let's see what type of sleep is he talking about because we're going to qualify this. We're going to quantify this sleep. Is he talking about the sleep where you just go to rest for eight or nine hours and you get up and go about your day? Or is he talking about another type of sleep? Is he talking about somebody who is spiritually asleep, being that they did not have their eyes open up to where they can see something? He's fixing to wake him up. By giving them more knowledge or giving them knowledge and information. Or is he talking about another type of sleep? We're fixing to find that out right here. So, verse 12. Then said his disciple, Lord, if he sleep, he should do well. How be it, 13. How be it, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he spoke of, spoke, that he had spoken of taking a rest in sleep. So he's speaking of something different. The disciples quite naturally thought that Jesus would talk about taking a sleep as far as rest. But Jesus said that he, he says he spoke about his death. So when in verse 11, when Jesus says, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of his sleep. He's speaking about death because he said right here in verse 13. Well, let me read down to in verse 12. They said, then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he should do well. How be it? Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he spoken of taking of rest in sleep. So verse 14. Then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So sleep in this instance is referring to death. And you could go read uh, Chronicles and Kings. And at the end of each king that had died, it talked about that they slept with their fathers. They slept with the their fathers, they slept with their fathers, being that they died. So in this instance, when we turn back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we speak it up at verse 13, Paul saying, but I will not have you to be ignorant, uninformed, unaware, having no knowledge, brothers, concerning them which are asleep, concerning them who are dead, not that ye sorrow not. So don't sorrow because of these people who died who are dead. Why? Even as others which have no hope. So there's other people. Who are these other people? These people who are not believers because Paul is not addressing them. He's addressing the church in Thessalonica, which are believers. So these other people who do not have hope, we're going to find out what this hope that they don't have is. But first, let's find out what hope is according to the Bible. Let's turn to... Uh, Let's turn to Romans 8 real quick. Let's turn to Romans 8. 
So we're not going to interpret anything. I forgot to say that, but that's one of the cardinal rules in this Bible study lesson, that we don't interpret anything. We let the Bible speak for itself. We come from the King James Version, and also we leave our denominational beliefs at the door. So therefore, when we read the Word of God, it's not going to be filtered through anything, any preconceived notions, any preconceived ideas. We're just going to read the Word of God and let it tell us what it is. So let's turn to Romans 8. And uh, we're going to go to verse 24. Romans 8, verse 24, we'll get an understanding of what hope is. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So hope is the expectation of something that you do not have right then and there. Because it says, we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. So if you already see, okay, I hope to win. I mean, I hope to get a promotion at work. But if you already received this promotion at work, then you're not hoping for it anymore because you already have it. So hope is not hope if it's already seen, right? That's what he's saying. So he said, for what, what man seeth, why does he yet hope? But if ye hope for that ye see not, then do you then do we with patience wait for it? So I hope to get this uh, promotion at work, but since I don't have it yet, I'm gonna patiently wait for it. So then that's what hope is. Hope is the expectation of something for which we do not have yet, but we anticipating having it sometime in the future. Okay, so let's go back to First Thessalonians and pick it back up at chapter 4, verse 13. And it says, but I hope, but I mean, but I would not have you to be ignorant, unaware, uninformed, without knowledge, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, who are dead, that ye sour not, don't be mournful of the people who have already died, even as others which have no hope. See, others who have no hope, they don't have no expectation of something in the future. Okay, well, let's see what this is, what this thing that's in the future that we are hoping for, which Paul is saying that. Those people who sour or who are sour for a moaning over those who have died, they don't have this hope. Well, let's see what this hope is. Verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which are which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. So those who are asleep or who are dead in Jesus, meaning those who died in Christ, those who died believing in Christ, right? If we believe that Jesus died and rose again from the grave, then we have the hope that on the last day when Jesus returns, which we're going to get into, then he's going to bring those people who have already died before us with him. And let's read this. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that which we are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, shall not prevent them which are asleep. So those of us who are still alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, let's leave, these are some very detrimental words that needs to be uh, 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 understood and hyphenated as we're going through this because it's talking about the coming of the Lord. Okay, so when we are, when people are still alive at the coming of the Lord, will not prevent those who are died in Christ, verse 16, for the Lord himself should descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of our archangels and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So the dead in Christ are going to rise when Christ returns. This is where they're getting their doctrine from, but we we're the rapture doctrine from, but we're reading down to this. So the dead in Christ are going to rise first during the resurrection. Remember that. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. So that means that no one's going to rise before Christ returns. To get these people right here. Because if somebody's first, that means there's no one before him. And when you say first, then that means there's going to be some afterwards. And we're going to get into that later on in the lesson. But it's important to understand that the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17. Then which, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So... Paul is writing this letters to these believers in Thessalonians, telling them not to be mournful. He, he's actually giving them a eulogy 
or an addressing at a funeral. He's telling these people who had loved ones died that you should not mourn and cry and be sorrowful because you have no hope like those who don't have hope. No, you have hope. What is this hope? You have hope because you believe that Jesus died and rose again. And in such, when he returns, he's going to rise those who died already, who we're crying from. And then we are going to be caught up with the Lord and meet him and our loved ones who, we're, who he's telling us not to mourn about right now in the sky. So this letter is referring to what Paul's writing this letter about. It's not about the rapture or people being taken away from the time of tribulation and take caught off to some secure and safe location. No, he's giving them a letter telling them about not to be mournful when somebody dies because you're going to see your loved ones if they died in Christ and you continue to live in Christ. You're going to see them at the first resurrection. That's what this letter is about. That's what these two, these two verses that they take out of context is about. So let's continue this. So then he ends it all. Let me, let me read on down from 16. He said, For the Lord shall, so the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What words? He's telling them, therefore, this is the end of the this is the end of this part of the letter. He's saying, wherefore, which is like, therefore, he's giving a conclusion. Therefore, comfort each other with these words. What words? That you're gonna see your loved ones again when the Lord returns. That is what these two verses are talking about. About when you put them with the rest of the letter that Paul is writing to these people in this segment of his letter. He's not referring to uh, swooping you off to some safe and secure location, bringing people out the grave and taking them to the rapture. He's never talking about that. That You can't get that from this. The only way that you can get a rapture where Jesus is going to return out of these two verses, verse 16 and 17, which clearly says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The only way that you can get a rapture out of this, the only way you can get a rapture from these two verses is if you add something to it. You have to bring something in here that is not in here. So let's go to Revelation 22 real quick and let's see what the Lord has to say about adding to his words or taking away from his words. Because the only way you can get a rapture out of those two verses right there is that you have, to, you have to add a whole bunch of other stuff that's not in this book to that. When we just clearly seen that those two verses are talking about people who were died and people who are still alive and they're going to see their loved ones later on when the Lord returns. So let's go to Revelation 22 and 18 real quick. Revelation 22 and 18. For I testify unto every man that hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. 19. And if any man should take away from the words of this book, from the word of the book of this prophecy, God should take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. See what God just got through saying about taking things away from his word and adding things to it? Let's go to one more place. Let's go to Proverbs. Let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30 and 5. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. 
Don't add, you cannot add to the word of God. God does not need your help in explaining anything that he wants to be explained to man. Now, like I said, the only way that you can get a rapture from those two, those two verses is that you have to add some more stuff to it that does not even, it's not in the Bible. But I want to continue on. I want to third. I just don't want to leave it right there. I want to thoroughly analyze this stuff because it's something detrimental. Because people believe that they're going to be raptured off before the time of tribulation. And when they find that themselves are still stuck here on earth during the time of tribulation, their faith is going to be shaken. And then they're going to begin to think, well, it don't mean nothing to me. I take this mark of the beast because everything else was a lie. So I want to thoroughly analyze this to give us some correct information so that we can make a correct decision at the end of the day. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I, I was supposed to leave a mark in there. I don't know what happened. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And... Be nice if I was in Thessalonians, but I'm in Timothy. Okay. So we're going to analyze this. We're going to thoroughly break this down. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. Those who believe in the rapture say that this is going to occur before the time of tribulation. They say, Jesus, this event right here is going to occur before the time of tribulation. Jesus is going to come back and swoop them off and take them to a location of security during the time of tribulation. Let's turn to Matthew 24 and let's see what Jesus had to say about his return. And why I go away that day? Matthew 24. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. This is very familiar ground. We're going to jump around. But Matthew 24, verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to shew him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there should not be left here one stone upon another that should not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what should be a sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they want to know what a sign, they want to know what some signs are that are going to be the end of the world. Or his coming, right? So then we're going to just run through this real quick. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See ye, be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. So he's giving them a whole list of things that's going to occur prior to him returning to earth, right? So let's skip on down to 15. When, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever read it, let him understand. So, Jesus is saying, when this particular individual stands in the holy place, he's going to tell you there's something you need to do. He's going he's gonna to tell you, at, when this person stands in the holy place, Something's fixing to happen. Verse 21. For then shall be for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world of this time, no, nor ever shall be. So once this abomination of desolation stands in the holy place, this is the beginning of the tribulation. Now, according to those who believe in the rapture, according to those who believe in the rapture, they're supposed to have been already raptured off. Jesus is supposed to already came down and took them and the dead out of the ground and took them to a secure location. But let's see what Jesus has to say about it. Now, the tribulation has begun because the abomination of desolation is sitting into 
uh, standing in the holy place, right? Now the great, uh, now the great tribulation has begun. Let's skip on down to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay, so now we're he, at, from 21 to 29, there's a lot of events here occurring, a lot of things happening that Jesus spoke about that's going to occur after the abomination of desolation stands in the holy place and the tribulation begins, which is three and a half years. Some of those who believe in the rapture say it's seven years, but they all agree there's a time of tribulation that's going to occur. They, they, they do not deny that. But what we're talking about is that Jesus is going to return before the tribulation begins or is he going to return after the tribulation begins? Now, we're at the end of the tribulation because in verse 29 it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then, after all this stuff occurs, the sun not giving her light, the moon losing her light, the stars moving from, from uh, uh, its place. After all this stuff happens, it, it, after the three and a half years of tribulation, it said, then shall appear the sun, the sign of the son of man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of earth mourn, and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. This is after the tribulation, when they see the Son of Man coming, and he shall send his angel with a great sound of a trumpet. We read that in First Thessalonians. And he they should gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So Jesus said that he's going to return immediately after the time of tribulation. Those who believe in the rapture says that He's going to return before the time of tribulation. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. First, I got to get a better marker. I know I put a marker in there. I got to get a better marker. Yeah, this will work. 1 <laughs> Thessalonians 4 16. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. We just read that. And with the trump of God, we just read that. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. So, Jesus said that this event is going to occur after the tribulation. Those who believe in the rapture said that this event is going to occur before the tribulation. So now you have a decision to make, brothers and sisters. Whose word has more authority in your life? Jesus or man? Who are you going to believe? Jesus said that he's going to return immediately after the time of tribulation. Man said that Jesus is going to return before the time of tribulation and take his believers out of harm's way to a secure location so they won't have to endure the tribulation. So that's just my first point I want to show you. So let's, get, let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. We're already there. 1 and 14, 4 and 16. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of all archangels, with the trump, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So once again, when you say somebody is first of doing anything, then it means that there's no one doing anything before them. So if the dead in Christ, those who've already died before this time occurs, whether you believe it's before the time of tribulation or whether you believe it's after the time of tribulation, these people are going to be rose first. That means nobody's going to be rose from the grave or from the dead before these people, right? Let's turn to uh, Revelation. Let's get some understanding on this. Let's get some clarity of this. Keep your marker here. We're going to go to Revelation 20. <clears throat> and we're going to be in Revelation 20 several times throughout the night. Revelation 20. And we're going to pick it up. At verse 1, Revelation 20 and 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So this right here is the beginning of Christ's thousand year rule because we know once, once, once this angel bounds up, the devil, he's going to be kept in bondage for a thousand years. 
And this is when Christ is going to reign on earth for a thousand years after he came back. But we get into that in other lessons. But for right here, verse 3 says, And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should not, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a season. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or upon their hands. So we know this is these, these souls that this man seen in this vision, these people who were beheaded were going through the time of tribulation, right? And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years during this thousand year reign. But the rest of the but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years was finished. This is the first resurrection. So Paul John is clearly saying that after the time of tribulation, which people were forced to take the mark of the beast, and if they did not take the mark of the beast, they would have their heads chopped off. I didn't put all that stuff in there to show you this stuff because, like I said. I, I would take up too much time. But you can go on and read where it tells you. Everybody knows about this who believes in the rapture. This is what they said that they're going to be removed from. So Paul is saying that he's seen these people's heads get chopped off who did not, accept, who did not receive or accept the mark of the beast in their forehead, for, uh, foreheads or in their palm of their hands. When Christ rose these people up, this was the first resurrection. So that means that this resurrection that Paul is seeing, um, John is seeing right here, is the same resurrection from when Christ came back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, when it said the dead in Christ rose first. Because there's no this is the first resurrection. There's no resurrection before this one. If there's no resurrection before this one, and then in 1 Thessalonians verse chapter 4 and 16, when it said the dead in Christ rose first, these people died right here in Christ. So these two things are the same events spoken of by different people pertaining to different subjects. Paul was speaking in relation to giving encouragement and words of endurement to people who are still alive that they would eventually see their loved ones who died in Christ. And when he comes back to resurrect them, at first, John is speaking about the end time prophecy as far as what he's seen as the people who went through the time of tribulation and what happened when they rose. But it's the same event. But the thing to highlight is this is after the time of tribulation. Not before, but after the time of tribulation. Let's go on. Let's look this. Let's look this up. The first resurrection occurred after the time of tribulation, not before. So this right there puts another nail in the coffin of the rapture when you say that Jesus Christ is going to return and pull you up before the tribulation. Jesus already said he's not going to return until after the tribulation. John has verified that that the first people who are going to rise in Christ or those who died in Christ and this is the first resurrection Paul said that the people who are going to be on that rapture bus a so called rapture bus are those who died in Christ they're going to be rose from the grave first so let's go on and keep on let's go to John 6 let's go to John 6 we're just working this thing down we're looking at it from all possible aspects and angles to get us a thorough understanding of what we're reading and what we're being told because it said, be loved. 1 John 4, 4 and 1. Be loved. Believe not every spirit. And we know that spirit is a word. But try the spirit's words and see where they are of God. Why must we do this? Because many, not a few, not some, but many of false prophets have gone out into the world. And that is what we're doing right now. We're studying to show ourselves approved, trying the spirit by the spirit, and we're going to prove all things, holding on to that which was good at the end of this. So we're going to thoroughly analyze 
this rapture. According to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. But right now we're going to uh, John 6. And we're going to pick it up at verse 39. John 6. And verse 39. And this is the Father's will, which he has sent me, that all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. So Jesus is talking about raising something up or some people up at the last day. Now we know, now we know whether you want to believe that the tribulation is for three and a half years or whether you want to believe that it's for seven years, we know that that the start of tribulation is at least three years. So that, when Jesus raised these people up, cannot be the last day when there's at least three and a half years left from once the abomination of desolation stands into the holy place. So <laughs> let's go to verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Here it is. He's saying he's going to raise them up at the last day. And we just see what Paul said, I'm mean, assuming what John said, that the first resurrection is at the end of the time of tribulation. And so therefore this last day has to be at the end of the time of tribulation for which Jesus is going to raise them up. So let's go on down to verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. So now he's talking about people who believe in Christ. He's going to raise them up at the last day. Verse 54. Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood and has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So we have Jesus saying multiple times that he's going to raise people up who believe in him at the last day. Let's go to John 11. Let's go to John 11 real quick. This, this is uh, after Jesus finally made it to the house of Martha and Mary and uh, Lazarus had died already. And he's having a, a, a conversation with Mary. Let's pick it up at verse 23. This is Mary talking to Jesus. John 11. And Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now let's see what Mary says. She says something very interesting as it pertains to our lesson. I'm mean, excuse me, Martha. And Martha said unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So, once again, we have John speaking about the first resurrection happening after the time of tribulation. Jesus repeatedly saying that he's going to raise people up at the last day. If Mary having an understanding that her brother will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. But when those who believe in the rapture say that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, when Jesus said he will raise the dead and Christ shall be raised first, they say this occurs at least three and a half years before the last day. Because they're going to be raised up first, and then those who are still living are going to be put on this rapture bus, and then they're going to be taken to a safe and secure location. That is not the last day, brothers and sisters. So now, therefore, you have a decision to make. Let's go back to First, uh, uh, first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You have a choice to make. You can believe those who say that the rapture is going to occur and they're going to be, this event right here is going to happen prior to the time of tribulation. 
which we know is at least three and a half years, so it's not the last day, or you can believe Christ. When he said he's going to raise up the, the dead at the last day, John said that the first resurrection, and right here Paul says the dead in Christ should rise first. These are the same two <coughs> events. Who you want to believe? You can believe those who believe in the rapture, or you can believe in Christ. We're just putting it on the table, brothers. It's not my intentions, it's not my goals, and not my objective to tell you what to believe. I'm just putting the word of God on the table without any filters and letting you, letting us as rational thinking human beings make our own decision based upon correcting. This is the only thing that we have to separate us from the rest of the animal kingdoms for which God has subjected to us is our intellect, our ability to reason, our ability to have rational thought and logic. Once we eliminate that, once we refuse to use that, then we're no better than any of the creatures that God has subjected to us. So therefore, we need to use this intellect and apply it to our study in the word of God to come with a correct decision based upon the information that we're getting without the filters of our denominational or preconceived beliefs. Okay, brother, so let's go on down to... Uh, Let's go to Job 11. Let's go to Job 11. So they want to talk about... <coughs> they want to talk about this event occurring before the time of tribulation where the dead is going to rise in Christ first. Okay, so let's, let's go to Job 11 and pick it up in verse 12. Whoa. Uh oh, something right. No, oh, excuse me. Oh man, that's bad. Job fourteen. Man, my eyesight is either my handwriting is bad or my eyesight is bad. One of the two, some bad. Job fourteen. I'm sorry. Job fourteen, and verse twelve. Well, now let's. I'm gonna start at verse ten and work my way down to twelve. And we're gonna come back to Job in another aspect too. Job fourteen and ten. But man dieth and wastes away. So we're talking about a man who died. Yeah, man gives up the ghost, and where is he? As the water fails from the sea, and the flood decay and dries up, so man lies down and raises not. Till the heavens be no more, they shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Let me read that one more time. I, I, we need some clarity. Let me read that one more time. Because we're told by those who believe in the rapture that the dead in Christ are going to be rose first and getting VIP seating on this rapture bus, which is going to occur prior to the time of tribulation. Job right here says, so man lieth down and he rises not till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake nor be raised out of their sleep. So in order for us to believe that the dead in Christ is going to be put on this rapture bus and caught off to someplace safety before the time of tribulation, and we know the time of tribulation is going to be at least three and a half years, whether you want to believe it's three and a half or seven years, we know it's at least three and a half years. So you telling me that the sky is not going to be there during these three and a half years? There's going to be no more sky. The only way that I can accept that the rapture is true is that I have to say that Job is lying right here. Job has to, because Job said the dead will not raise out of their sleep. The dead, he said, man lies down and rises not until the heavens be no more. And we already seen what Jesus said when he returns immediately after the time of tribulation, the sky, they say the sky's gonna roll back, the sun's gonna lose its light, the moon's gonna lose its light, the stars are gonna fall. That's when there's no more, that's when there's no more heaven. And Jesus said that's after the time of tribulation. 
Job is saying basically the same thing. But for me to believe the rapture, then I have to discount what Job is saying right here. Or you telling me that there's not going to be any sky around for at least three and a half years while the, while the dead is in this secret location of safety during the rapture period. That's that's what that's that that that's what we have to get from this. Let's go back to first. Like I said, we on we on in and out. We with meticulously breaking this thing down. First Thessalonians, chapter four. First Thessalonians, chapter four, verse sixteen. And this time, this marker gonna stay up in here. It says, "For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven." With a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Job just got through saying that this is not going to happen until the heavens be no more. You have a decision to make, brothers and sisters. You have a decision to make. Are you going to believe the word of God, which says that this event is going to occur immediately after the time of tribulation, or are you going to believe the word of man who said this event is going to occur prior to the time of tribulation? So like I said, I'm not going to tell you what to believe. I'm not going to say that the rapture is true. I'm not going to say the rapture is false. I'm going to take, God said, try every spirit. And that's all I'm doing. And right now it is not adding up. What, what, what they're saying and what God's saying is not adding up when we when we study the word, study to show thyself approved. Rightly dividing the word of God. So let's go on. Let's go to Matthew 24 again. Talk about a secret rapture. They say this event's going to occur. Uh, people going to be driving their cars. People going to be on the bus. People going to be walking their dogs. And then all of a sudden, when Jesus returns, they're going to be plucked up. Bing, 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 bing. All before anybody knows anything. Now we already seen, and then the verse that they use that the scripture they say he's gonna be allowed, it's gonna come the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. Come on, man. Everybody's gonna hear that. But we're just sticking with this. This part right here. Let's go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 24. Well, I thought, Matthew 24. And pick it up at 29. Matthew 24. And we're gonna pick it up at verse 29. Okay, once again, it said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, so the sun be darkened. Everybody's going to see that sun. Everybody, everybody see the sun right now in the sky shining. Everybody's going to see that sun darkened. And the moon should not give her light, and the stars should fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven should be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of, heaven, son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of earth mourn. So when Jesus returns, it says all the tribes, everybody who's going to mourn. So when he returns, it's not going to be a secret because he's saying every, everybody's going to mourn when he returns. So where is this secret at? This secret rapture. People getting plucked up off the earth. Nobody knowing who's there. When he returns, everybody's going to know he's there. Everybody going to say, what's that? From light, lightning shots from one in the earth, from the east to the west. So shit is coming to the sun. I mean, everybody going to see that. There's going to be so much noise and so much shaking of the stars. You see the sun losing its light, the moon losing its light, stars falling. There's going to be a shaking up of the heaven. And you telling me the only people going to see this are those who are being raptured off and everybody else is going to be walking around like nothing's going on? Come on, man. We got you. We can't, we can't accept, man. Come on, man. Come on, that don't even add up. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to I oh, let me let me finish. Uh, thirty one, and he shall send his angels, and a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So it's a, it's it's not going to be unknown. So all that that doctrine about. A secret rapture, no one's not gonna know is occurring. That you can believe that, but you gotta get rid of this what we just got through reading. So once again, who you gonna believe? You're gonna believe the man who says this event's gonna happen in secret, 
unbeknownst to anybody except for the, the uh, chosen people who are being raptured? Are you going to believe in Christ? He said the whole earth. He said all the tribes of earth are going to mourn when he returns. It's your decision, brothers, sisters, who you going to listen to. Let's go to Isaiah 24 real quick. Isaiah 24. I think we might be here several times. Isaiah 24 and 29. Oh, no. Yeah, I go again. Excuse me. Matt, I mean, uh, uh, Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13 and 9. Isaiah 13 and 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the man desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and it is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Brothers, we just got through reading that, right? How is no, nobody going to know this event's occurring? I, 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 I can't fathom it. How, how can somebody not know that the stars are going give, to not give their light anymore? But this is a secret. People just being plucked up off the earth. And, man, have you seen Johnny? Man, I ain't seen Johnny in a minute. I don't know where he's at. Come on, man. It ain't going to happen. That, that's, I mean, well, I mean, like I said, you can believe that, but you got to get rid of all this other stuff we're talking about. Let's go to Joel 2. Let's go to Joel 2 and look at this so-called secret, uh, continue to look at this secret, the secretness of the Lord returning. Joel 2, and we're going to pick it up in verse 10. The earth should quake before them, the heavens should tremble, the sun and the moon should be darkened, and the stars should withdraw their shining, and the Lord should utter his voice before his army. For his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide? I mean, come on, man. Where is the secret in this? Everybody's going to know this. Everybody is going to know this. It's not a secret. It's not a secret. And all this is occurring. All this is because how many times? How many times did the sun and the moon? going to lose its light. Jesus said this is going to occur. Let's go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. I'm going to keep my finger there. Matthew 24 and verse 29. Jesus said immediately after the tribulations of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. We just we have to read about this in Isaiah and in Joel. How many times is this going to occur? And this is happening immediately after the time of tribulation. When Jesus returns, when people say that this is going to, he's going to, this, all this stuff is going to happen after he returns. Those who believe in the rapture would tell us this stuff happened before. Because this stuff happens when he returns. And we already seen that the dead in Christ will rise first. John already said that the first resurrection was after the time of tribulation. Once again, who is it that you're going to believe? Let's go to uh, Amos. Let's go to Amos real quick. Oh, that's the nine. Let's go to Amos 5. I'm just doing away with this secretness, the secretness of this rapture. Uh, <laughs> and like I said, the letter is a letter that Paul wrote. And what Paul was speaking about had nothing to do with what they saying. It had something to do with encouraging people who had lost their loved ones, that they would see their loved ones at the end time when Christ returns. 
Now, how you get a rapture out of this, how Jesus is going to come and swoop you off and take you to some secure location and bring the dead with them, give them VIP seating on that rapture bus, is beyond me. It's not here. If it is, you know, show me some more scriptures so I can go analyze. But those two scriptures that they use is clearly not it. So we're going to Amos 5 and 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Everybody's going to see the day of the Lord. It's not when, the, when Jesus Christ returns, it's not going to be a secret. It's going to be darkness, utter darkness, a shaking up of the heavens. I mean, look, man, when people, when they had these meteorology, meteorite showers and stuff, man, you have people all around the world looking at the sky at nighttime and doing, oh, ooh, and all. When they see all these meteorites flashing and streaking across the world, I'm um, streaking across the skyline. Man, if that'll fascinate you, man, you mean to tell me when every single light in the sky that we see at night begins to move around out of, out of something that we do not normally associate with them, ain't nobody going to know nothing about that, except for those who are being raptured off in a secret? Is that what is that what they having us believe? Because that's what they have to be saying when you compare it to what the word of God says. In order for us to believe that, we have to discontinue this so let's go back to first Thessalonians first Thessalonians chapter chapter 4 verse 16 we just we just breaking this thing like for the Lord himself should descend from heaven with the shout with the voice of an archangel with the trump of God and the dead in Christ should rise first we already seen that no numerous places, but I want to take another look at it, another aspect. They're saying the whole point of this rapture is that Jesus Christ is going to return before the time of tribulation, take them to a safe and secure location for which they will not be affected by the time of tribulation and events of tribulation. And the first people on that rapture bus who has VIP seating are people who are dead. So I want to look at this aspect about those people who are dead being the first ones to be put on this bus to go to a place of safety. Let's go to Job, back to Job 14. Let's go back to Job 14. Okay, we're going to go to Job 14, and we're going to pick it back up at 10 again. Okay, man died and wasted his way. Yeah, man gives up the ghost, and where is he? Verse, we're going to skip to verse 12. So man lies down and rises not, till the heavens be no more. They should not awake, nor be raised, raised out of their sleep. Here's where we're coming from. Oh, that thou would hide me in the grave, that thou would keep me secret until thy wrath be passed, that thou would appoint me at set time and remember me. So Job was hoping and wishing that when the wrath of God comes through, he's going to be in the grave, right? Job wants to be in the grave. He wants to be asleep. He wants to be dead, right? Let's go to Isaiah 26. I'm just getting some expert witnesses, like in a court of law. Right now, I'm just putting some expert witnesses on the stand right now to give us some information about this end time tribulation and where people of knowledge, people who are, who are the messengers ordained by God, where they want to be, where they feel the place of safety is. Okay, so we're going to Isaiah 26 and uh, picking up a verse 20. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers. He's speaking about it, uh, uh, the grave, right? And shut thy door before thee, about thee. Hide thyself as it were for a little while, a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth, 
for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. So Isaiah is even saying that the place to be during the time that the Lord brings about his wrath, the place of safety, is in the grave. Job said it. Isaiah said, these are expert witnesses. Let's go to, let's get us another expert witness. Let's go to Habakkuk. Let's go to Habakkuk 3. <clears throat> Habakkuk 3. And we're going to skip around. We're going to, we're going to uh, identify that this is the end time. Habakkuk 3. And we'll start at verse 10. The mountains saw thee, and they trembled. The overflowing of water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hand on high. The sun and the moon stood still in their habitation, and the light of thy arrows they went away, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. So this is talking about the end time when the Lord is coming back, right? Verse 16. When I heard, my belly trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered to my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. He's not talking about taking a nap. He's not talking about lounging out in, the, in there. We already seen at the beginning of this lesson what rest, sleep, and death in this instance are synonymous. So he's saying that he want to be dead when this trouble comes through. And it says that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up into, unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. So there we got three expert witnesses saying that during the time of this tribulation, during the time the Lord's wrath comes by, they believe that the safest place to be or where they want to be is in the grave. Let's go to Revelations. Now let's get some eyewitnesses to this event. Let's go to Revelations 9. Revelations 9. And we're going to pick it up at verse 6. And, and in those days, those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And this is speaking about during the time and the Lord bringing his wrath upon the earth, right? Men are going to want to seek death. They're going to wish that they were dead, but they can't die. They're going to have to endure all this affliction that's occurring. So to them, <laughs> the safest place or the most secure place to be is in the grave. Right? So let's go to, I'm almost sure, let's go to Ecclesiastes. Get us some more, some more witnesses, man. I like bringing some more people to the witness stand. Let's go to Ecclesiastes 9. And I'm going to tie this up in a few minutes. Ecclesiastes 9. I'm picking up a verse 2. All things, are, all things are like to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and to the clean, and to the unclean, and to him that sacrifice, and to him that sacrifice not. As is the good, so is the sinner. And he that swear, as he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yeah, also the heart of the son of men is full of evil and madness in their heart while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. So we're talking about dead, people being dead right now, right? Here's where we're going. For the living know that they should die, but the dead know nothing. The dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So here he's saying that the dead know not. So that means that when we see these people protesting 
or having a big ruckus because they have a new construction going on that might be clearing away land. They might be extending the highway or building a new suburb uh, subdivision in the neighbor uh, a community, and they happen to stumble across some <coughs> stumble across some bones and uncover a forgotten cemetery. All that protesting about let the dead rest in peace and you disturbing the dead and all this and that. Man, them people don't know nothing that's going on around them. They don't know, according to this, it said the dead know not. They know not anything. So that means when they're taking up their bones and supposed to be transporting their bones to another location and replanting it into another grave, they don't know that they were taken from one cemetery to another cemetery. They don't know if you took their bones, crashed it up, and made it into some dog feed. Because the dead know not. That's what this is saying right here, right? Let's go on. Let's get, let's, 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 let's get a little bit more. I'm going to wrap this up after this one. Well, this part of it. Let's go to Job. Let's go back to Job 14. Let's go to Job 14. And it's speaking about the dead. We're going to start at verse 20. Thou prevailest forever against him. And he passes. Thou changest his constant and sending him away. His sons come to honor and he know it not. He's talking about a dead man. His sons come to honor. He has no knowledge of it. We just got to read about the dead knows not, right? And they are brought low, but he perceives it not of them. So the dead know not. Job is verifying this. So that means that if a person was to die in what we call Houston, Texas today, back in a time period where we call 1432. That person's body was put in the grave, however, whatever happened to his body, that person does not know the events or the history that done transpired of the location for which he died in Houston, Texas today. He does not know that Texas has been under six different flags. He does not know whether there's a Republican or a Democrat running this country. He does not know anything about anything that we know about who are alive. He doesn't even know that he's in the land of Texas, which is a part of the United States. He does not have no knowledge of this. And he certainly doesn't know if his sons or, or his ancestors are going through a time of tribulation or being forced to worship some other uh, 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 deity or object or something and if they don't, they're going to be put to death. He had no knowledge of any of this, right? Because it says he did, his sons come to honor he knows or not. His sons are brought low, he perceives it not. So, what does all that have to do with this? Well, let's turn back to 1 Thessalonians and I'm going to tie all this up with a pretty nice bow. Now, they said those who believe in the rapture, that Jesus is going to return and transport those who believe in him before the time of tribulation to a secret location where they're going to be safe and secure. And the first people who are going to be on this, on this bus, this rapture bus, is going to be the dead. So now we just got through reading from expert witnesses in Isaiah Joel, Habakkuk, uh, 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 and uh, Solomon, or Solomon, about people wishing to be in the grave during this time. So these people, and you had our witnesses saying that they want, they wish they were dead. And then I didn't even read the other uh, in Revelation where it said that they wish that the that the uh, rocks and mountains would fall upon them. But these people wish that they were buried in the grave during the time of this wrath and tribulation occurred. They have no knowledge of the wrath and tribulation occurring. So you mean to tell me, those who believe in the rapture, that you're going to wake these people up out their sleep, take them out of their safe and secure location according to the word of God, give them knowledge of a tribulation that's occurring for which they had no type of knowledge of and transport them to a safer place than they was in prior to you coming with this rapture? Is that what you're telling me, man? That's that's what you have to be. That's, that is a logical conclusion of what you're saying when you said that the dead in Christ will rise first and be taken 
to a secure and safe location. So you're not going to get on that bus first. The dead and Christ are going to get put on that bus first. Then you're going to get put on that bus. And then y'all going to go to a safe location. So how is it that the time of tribulation is going to affect anybody who's in the grave? These are questions you have to ask, brothers and sisters, using your logic, using your intellect that the Lord gave us. You can believe what you want. If you want to continue to believe that, that the rapture is true, then you have to disregard everything we just got through reading. You have to use. There's no way you can reconcile that somebody lying. Somebody lying, just like somebody was lying in that garden. God said, you should surely die if you eat of this tree. The devil said, you should surely not die if you eat of this tree. And it was up to Eve to decide who had more authority in her life. God or the devil. And when she ate of that tree, she in fact said that God was lying. But she found out otherwise. And the same thing with us, brothers and sisters, when you talk about this rapture being taken from a secure take, there's no, man, let me keep, let me go on, man. I got a few more places. Let's name a few. Let's go to Matthew, back to Matthew 24. Let's go back to Matthew 24. We're going to talk about this tribulation beginning. Matthew 24, 15. Jesus says, When you therefore shall see the abomination and desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. So once you see this, Jesus already said in, in, in verse 21, For then shall great tribulation such as, so this, for there, for this shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no should there be. But he tells you something. Before, after 15, when you see the abomination of desolation, he tells you to do something. Verse 16, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take out, take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. So Jesus is telling you when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, this is the beginning of the uh, tribulation. But he's telling you to flee. Now my question is this. I thought that Jesus is supposed to rapture us off. And then according to this rapture, he's supposed to be plucking us up one by one from all over. Oh, I, I know what it is. We're fleeing. He's telling us to flee to the rapture assembly spot. That's what it is. We're fleeing to the rapture assembly spot. That's why he's telling you to flee. And only those who are very elect, those who, who, who are his true servants, know where this rapture assembly or muster point is located because it's a secret. Man, get off the nonsense, man. Can't say that to me. Man, let's go to Revelation 20. If, if, if Jesus is rapturing you off, why is he telling you to flee? And this is after, this is at the start of the tribulation, he's telling you to flee. He's supposed to already have swooped you up before the tribulation even began. But who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Jesus? Or are you going to believe man? Let's go to Revelation 20. Got a few more spots. Revelations 20. And chapter 4. I mean, Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus Christ. So some people, he seen some people who were killed as a witness for Jesus Christ, right? And the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they did the reign of Christ for a thousand years. Okay, so these people were killed during the time of tribulation. So my question to you is, 
What is it? Why weren't they on that rapture bus? What did these people do that caused them to miss that rapture bus? Or what is it that they didn't do? No, you know, this is something that for you who do not really know your Bible, you need to go and ask, you know, you need to go with the man of your preacher to explain to you what it is that these people did that caused them not to get raptured off that off. Or what it is that they didn't do that caused them to not get raptured off. So therefore, you won't do what they did or you won't, or you will do what they didn't do. Because you want to get raptured. And it clearly says right here, somebody got left behind, pun intended. Somebody got left behind who were believers in Christ. And that level of sincerity in believing in Christ caused them to get killed because they refused to take the mark of the beast. So you need to find out what it is that they did or they, they didn't do that caused them not to get raptured off. He got to explain this because some people got left behind. See what happens when you study the word of God? Instead of letting somebody tell you it's a whole different world. Some people got left behind who truly believe in God. Are you sure you're not one of them people? Are you sure you, the, the, per, the people who are talking to me every time I tell them, talk to them about end time and are they prepared? Well, I'm going to be raptured up. I ain't got to worry. Are you sure you're not one of these people going to be left behind? Because somebody got left behind who believed in Christ. And you need to go ask your priest. You need to demand him to tell you what they did or what they didn't do so you would do what they didn't do and not do what they did do because you want to be raptured off. Let's go to verse 13. I mean, chapter uh, uh, Revelation 13, man. This is our last spot. Revelation 13. This is talking about the dragon, right? It's talking about, we, we just read on down to it. It says, uh, chapter 4, I mean, verse 4. And they worshiped the dragon. Which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things, and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, which is three and a half years. So we know it's a minimum of three and a half years for those who believe in a seven year uh, uh, period of tribulation. We know it's a minimum of three and a half years right here. And he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell on earth. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given to him over all kindred and tongues and nations. So these same saints who he was given the power to overcome them were the same ones we read about in chapter 20 whose heads were chopped off. So once again, why weren't these people raptured off? Because he said, how can he make war with people who's not there? How can he make war with some people who are not there? Because according to you who believe in the rapture, you're going to be raptured off. All the believers in Christ are going to be taken out of the way in a secret location. So I'm going to go back to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to pick it up, chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, our last spot. As we already seen, this is a letter that Paul's talking about to people who had died, giving words of a curse. It's like he's at a funeral or writing a letter to some people who had their people just died, and he's giving them words of encouragement. But Based on these two verses, 15 and 16, I'm fixing to read, they build a rapture doctrine. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that is the rapture doctrine. Two verses. But I done went over at least a hundred verses to destroy that. 
Now let me just just a sheer level, and I had to take out a lot of stuff just to keep a time frame. But just to give you an idea, just the sheer volume of evidence that was put forth alone versus the lack of evidence that they put forth should give you enough reasonable doubt in the belief of a rapture. Let me give you an, an, an analogy of that. It's like you go on a trial for murder. The state puts on, the state presents their case before the jury. The evidence they present, they got forensic evidence. They got the blood, blood, blood spatter from the victim's body that was found on the clothes which you was wearing at the time of your arrest. They got the gunshot, uh, gunshot uh, residue showing that you fired a gun. They got the gun that matches the bullets that was found inside the victim's body that was found on you at the location when you was arrested. They got videotape surveillance showing you going into the place robbing these people, shooting the victim several times. Not only do they have that, but they have your social media page showing you on Facebook Live shooting this man in his store while you robbing him, said, hey, see, bam, bam, bam. They presented all this evidence, indisputable evidence. And the only thing that your lawyer presents for the jury to review and think that this is weighty enough to disregard everything that they have already seen thus far is that your lawyer presents a receipt for a purchase of gas made on your debit card at the time of this robbery occurred miles away. Knowing that could be anybody using your debit card. But your lawyer wants the jury to disregard all that irrefutable evidence and take this one credit card receipt as enough to say that you, you didn't commit the crime. That is the same thing with this rapture doctrine. Two verses that don't even fit with what is being said with the other five verses next to it. That's verse 15 and 16. But what about 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18? When you read all of them verses together, you get a completely totally different picture. We went through scripture after scripture after scripture, and each one of those scriptures, you have to discredit. You have to just throw that out the window in order to believe the rapture. But as I said, brothers, so my objective and my intention is not to tell you what to believe, not to tell you that what you believe in is true or false. All we're doing here at the Israel Bible Institute is taking what the Lord says. We're studying to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of God, studying the word of God. And doing that, we have built ourselves up a reservoir of knowledge. So therefore, when somebody comes to us with something of a doctrine, we are able to do what God said to do. He said, be loved. Believe not every spirit, and we already learned in other lessons that those spirits are words, but try the spirits and see if they are God. So we will try what people say according to what we have already studied in this book. Just like when Paul came to him, came to him in a, 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 a preaching the word and preaching the word to the Jews in Berea, they just didn't accept what he said. They said in verse or chapter 17 of Acts, he said. They searched the scripture daily to see if it was true. Yeah, what you're talking about sounds good, Paul, but we're going to see what you said line up with what the word of God said. So that is what we do here. And once we try the spirit, by the spirit, because God said many of false prophets have gone out into the world. Jesus has said that many are going to come in his name saying that he is Christ. And in doing that, they're going to deceive many. Paul also said that there are people of uh, false, false, false apostles and deceitful workers transforming themselves into ministers of Christ. And no marvel because Satan himself was an angel of light. He transformed himself into an angel of light. So it's no great thing that his ministers, who are angels, transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. So we have to try everything. And that's all we're doing, brother and sister. And at the end of this, if you still believe in the doctrine of the rapture, hey, all praise and glory be to God. In Jesus' name. I just pray that you will take something I said 
will cause you to actually go back and say one thing you can't get around is that somebody is going to be left some people who honestly believe in Christ are going to be left behind they're going to be left behind because it says I saw the heads of those saints who did not worship the beast so you need to go ask a preacher or you need to go study and find out what they did or what they didn't do that caused them to miss that rapture bus. But with that, brother and sister, man, I pray that you was edified. I pray that somebody's eyes were open. And I thank you for your time. And the Sabbath is coming in. I won't be able to, uh, it's been a couple, about another 30 minutes. But uh, in advance, happy Sabbath, my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen.